Amen, my Facebook family. Good afternoon. It is Palm Sunday. It is 2 o'clock, 2.03 here on the East Coast. And to God be the glory for the great things he has done and continue to do in our lives. Uh, I'm coming before you after already having service and uh, the North location there and uh, Maryland, Bowie, Maryland, and now I'm here in our southern location of Fayetteville, North Carolina, and looking to bring you a word that I pray will uh, absolutely just touch you and allow God to really do some new things in your life, and especially as we think upon this time frame and what this time is uh, meaning in our lives and in the life of a Christian. Uh, not everybody probably, you know, uh, talks about the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, but it matters, it matters, it matters, it matters that we have the history and the understanding of what was happening to Jesus in those days before he would go to that cross. Amen. So to God be the glory. Father, in the name of your precious son, Jesus, Lord God, I pray that you allow me to dispense this word, Lord God, the way that you would have me to dispense it, Father. I pray, Lord God, that you would increase in me as I decrease, Father, and allow the drippings from Calvary's cross, Lord God, to saturate me in such a way that everything that is me would now be thine, Lord God, that, Lord, that, that when this is all said and done, that the devil would be horrified, Lord God, that we would, we would upset, Lord God, as a body of Christ, Lord God, things just as you did it in the days of walking in the earth, that you had the people so afraid that the only way they thought they could get rid of you was to crucify you but they didn't know what they were doing they were elevating you father and i thank you in the name of jesus that you loved us so much that you allowed your son our brother jesus christ to go to that old rugged cross on our behalf that we would be able to receive that which you have for your children in jesus precious and righteous name have thine own way amen 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 uh, so again, I greet you in the name of Jesus. I pray to God that uh, you are able to experience this word and receive it the way in which God has given it to me. Amen. Uh, and so the palms have already been blessed on today. And, uh, and so we will give those out as uh, when, when I finish. Amen. Amen. So my scripture text today, the triumphal entry, and I'm coming from the book of John, chapter 12, verses 12 through 13. And again, it's John, St. John, chapter 12, verses 12 through 13. And it reads thusly, The next day a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches, palm trees, branches of palm trees, and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. What a greeting, what a greeting in such a time that these people would uh, stop now. And again, they didn't have entertainment like we have it on today. So I can only imagine just based upon the writings in the word of God that uh, there were several because uh, how many of you know that most of the time when you get a crowd, a lot of them are just spectating. They're just coming to see what is going to really happen, not having always the insight or know-how or understanding what's going to happen nor why, but they just want to show up to see if it happens. Amen? And so we know that there, there was truly a triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and, uh, and so Jesus had to go through such a battery of just insults, beatings, uh, mocked and scourged and I mean you name it they did it to him and today we don't even want to have to deal with a little uh, just being upset because we think our whole world is going to crumble down when we are unable to just accept what is going on in our lives but trust God with everything that took place on Calvary's cross, that it has already been finished, that it's already been decided that we would be victorious in everything that we would deal with. Amen. And so uh, today I pray to be able to bring a little bit more of uh, what's happening during that triumphal entry. Amen. And so the title here today 
is follow me, but I'm coming to you also with a, sub, uh, a subtitle. And my subtitle is No More Excuses. No excuses. We have excuses for everything. And, and, and most of our excuses are based on putting it on somebody else because we don't want to have to deal with our own issues. We, we feel better when we can say it's somebody else's fault or, you know, I don't like that church because it ain't this or I don't like that preacher so I'm not going on Sunday instead of looking for God in the imperfect person, you know, we, we always looking at them instead of the perfect God and something needs to be done with, done about that, especially when we look at what is taking place here as we celebrate this Palm Sunday. Amen. There was a, a crowd of people that had gone out and, and everything that they were doing, it was all about, uh, for the, from the spectator's place, seeing what was going to happen. Now, we must remember that on the cross beside Jesus uh, also, as all of this was taking place, once Jesus had made his way through Jerusalem and went through everything that he would have to go through before going to that cross, there were some other things that began to take place. One of them is that we know that there were two other people that were on that cross with him. And on that cross with him, uh, one of the fellas, instead of him joining in with the crowd, he decided, you know what? God, you know, uh, Jesus, um, you know, instead of mocking him and following through with, with what everybody else was doing, let me just read this. It says, we must remember that on the cross beside Jesus, one of the criminals mocked Jesus as the crowd did. So you got folks that are going to follow the crowd. And again, so, hence our title today. Um, but the other guy was concerned enough about his life and his soul, obviously, that he defended Jesus and then acknowledged his sins. And at that very moment, Jesus wiped his slate clean. He wiped this man's slate clean that was hanging up on that cross beside him and said to him, from this day, you will be with me in paradise. So what's wrong with us? How long will we follow the crowd? Again, uh, my text here today is follow me. Uh, subtitle, no excuses. And so here's my scripture, another scripture text for you on today. Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 24, which will give you a little bit more insight in, as to uh, what I just read to you. It says, then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. And again, follow me. No more excuses, meaning follow Jesus. Because as I said, the people were following the crowd. The people were caught up in what was happening with the crowd. And, you know, we, we don't have or we lack too often the, con the confidence to stand on our own two feet with what we believe. That is a problem. That's a problem because the Bible tells us that we are to be able to defend the word of God. Amen. Not fight about it, not argue about it, but we ought to at least be sound enough in what we believe or confident enough in what we believe. If we see something happen, because I, I just don't know many of us as a parent that if we saw somebody harming our children that we would, uh, or child, that we would just sit back and allow them to do whatever they so desire to hurt our child. I know I wouldn't. I, I, I made a name for myself back in the day, you know, I, I I was I was young, surrendered to the Lord, and you know, I that I, I talk about the T-shirt, you know, don't don't uh, move too fast as you approach me because I ain't been saved that long, and so there were things that I would deal with. I my my cousin the other day, she put down a um, a, uh, a post, and she was talking about her daughter, how her daughter was harmed uh, mentally uh, and emotionally by a teacher 
who felt that she didn't have what it took. And so, um, I mean, she was she was hurt by that. And of course, any child would hurt being demeaned by somebody they're looking to that's supposed to support them. And so she wrote this beautiful uh, post and put up that she that particular day when her daughter was feeling that way in school and she went to pick her up, that she, uh, she declared that particular day as national her daughter's name, Day. Amen. And I loved it. I thought of that thing, you know, because what she did was she dealt with that in a, in a beautiful way that would take the power away from the derogatory thing that had been done to her daughter to turn it into something that would really, to this day, make her daughter feel good about who she is. Amen. Because what happened is by celebrating her daughter, not celebrating the lie or, or giving in to what was being said about her, she made it all about the beautiful things that uh, that is about her daughter, that represents her daughter, or that her daughter represents. And as I read it, I thought, oh, that is so beautiful. Wow. Well, when I had the same thing that happened with my daughter, um, and, and I went into the school building, and I, 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 I go to the top, y'all. I, I don't deal with the, the, the peons and the people. On If you can't give me no answer, you ain't the one I'm looking for. And so, which is why when I, I think about the, the disciples, when they said to Jesus of regarding a Serenician woman, you know, uh, she's bothering us. Send her away. She wasn't coming for them. They were completely twisted in their thought process. She was not looking for them. Likewise with the lady who was oiling down Jesus, you know, during this time frame that we celebrate now. They're talking about the money that they can make off that oil and what they can do. And while their cause was a good one, but they, they were missing the point. It wasn't about them. It was about Jesus at that moment in time. And so we have to make what's going on about Jesus. What would Jesus do? And so as I continue to just think upon what my cousin did and the acknowledgement of just looking at the good in her daughter and celebrating that good, and then again, I went back to what I had done. And by the time I left the school that day and I, I had a, a, a conversation with the principal, the next day when I went up there, because I also used to teach uh, flag twirl and I was their auxiliary core person and um, you know they were doing some stuff to my baby that uh, wasn't wasn't kind and and so when I got to the school that next day to just do what I do they had a big old sign I mean it was a maid at the Kinko's or wherever you get I mean the professional sign that stated no one can enter this building and meet with the principal unless a prior scheduled meeting has been made I said oh wow I guess the word got out we can't just trust anybody in that building because if we mess with somebody's child, you might just get somebody like Miss Harley because I'm telling you, I, I made it clear before. Before there was Tyler Perry and Medea, I am the original Medea. Don't mess with my children. And I mean that even to this day. But not now because of what I will do, but because of what my father, their father, their big brother, my big brother will do as our advocate. And so we have to be confident in what we know so that, so that when we are responding or find ourselves in the midst of people, even the midst of a crowd, what direction are we leaning to? Are we leaning towards the, the direction as I did to just take things in my own hand? Or are you going to build up that which you know to be good? Are you going to be afraid? Am I going to be afraid to be able to defend that which we know to be right? Especially, and here's where I was concerned, so many of these people walked with Jesus. They saw what Jesus was doing. But when it came time to this triumphal entry into Jerusalem, so many of them, as we know that Peter even had denied him at one point, people will, they won't do what they need to do. And we have to stop making excuses as to why we do what we do and start doing what the Bible has called us to do, has given us to do as Christians, as Christians that are confident in the God that we serve because we are able we are we are fearfully and wonderfully made there is absolutely nothing that should keep keep us 
from being able to support someone who's being mistreated, particularly when it comes down to Jesus Christ, when we know they've done no wrong. Amen. Who are you going to follow? Who are you going to follow? I have shared my, my, it is a testimony at this point in time, things that I went through at the hands of some Christians, twistings, and uh, you would have thought that they would have been lifting me up and praying for their sister in Christ, but what they did was they tried to tear me down. Who are you following? Do you want to be known as those people? Because here's what was going on when it came down to Jesus, as the crowd fell into, yet so many of them just coming to be spectators. You know, the others were waving the palms and throwing them down, and they celebrated Jesus. Uh, then you had the, the two uh, criminals on the cross. One fell in with the crowd and talking all his uh, whatever, and the other one found his soul, you know. If by chance this, this man is who he say he is, you know, and, and I know he hasn't done any wrong. It just only makes sense to me that I would find myself on the right side of Jesus so that no matter what happens, I will have made my peace with what I believe, not based upon somebody else. But as the man stated, he said, but he's done no wrong. So he knew enough about Jesus to say that he knew he hadn't done any wrong and he doesn't deserve to be there. But we follow people right into the, the, the barrel of a gun too often because we'd rather be seen or with a click than to stand on our own two feet with what we know. He says this man has done no wrong. That in order for him to have spoken with such authority as he did, he must have had witnessed something. Or as it happened even with Rahab, sometimes we hear word. We know. We get word. Word travels. And so he was able to boldly say, but he's done no wrong. And Jesus there listening <laughs> Glory be to God. He said, today, you shall be with me in paradise. And so, you know, we have to really make the decision. What side of the cross are we going to find ourselves on? What side of history will we find ourselves on? What side of life will we find ourselves on? Who are we going to follow? Are we really looking to be better as Christians or are we comfortable with the status quo as wherever the crowd goes, that's where it will go. Uh, wherever you, your friend or what have you says, oh, but it's all right. You know, I remember when I was younger, we hear parents say, so you're going to do whatever so-and-so tells you to do. So if they tell you to jump off a, a bridge, you're going to jump off that bridge as well. We have to know what we know what we know so that we can make right decisions for our lives basis, uh, versus following people that are going to lead us down a pathway that's not going to be the one we prefer to go down. Amen? And so my points here on today, are you willing to follow Christ? If you're willing to follow Christ, there are some things that have to take that have to take place. First of all, you have to make the decision that you are going to follow Christ. And with following Christ, there comes a set of rules and regulations. I've preached to run and shout before, to ransom before, that there's a code of conduct. Now, and every so often, we may fall off the wagon. I, I've been there, I did that, and, uh, and, and God made me better for it. But I quickly, because I knew the code of conduct, that I needed to repent and turn my life around. Amen? To God be the glory. And so I did. And so I am where I am today. But the code of conduct was one in which that whatever is going on in my life, if it does not line up with what God's word says, then I have to stay clear away from it. Sometimes it may be a struggle, but I am strengthened by the word of God. I am made stronger by the word of God. Even if I sometimes even may think 
about something or stay on that thought process too long if the people that I am around are supportive in the direction I'm going on, going in, even they will help me. Be, be, be very aware of the crowd that you follow, amen? Because your crowd can lead you down a road that you rather not be on. A crowd can lead you to a place as it did with the other man who is not in paradise with, with the Savior. Uh, you know, hey, it is what it is because heaven as well as hell, they're real. And we're going to spend eternity somewhere. So are you willing, am I willing to follow Christ? Are we willing to do whatever it's going to take for us to follow Christ? Because if, if we're not, then we're going to struggle. We're going to always wonder why things are happening to us, not realizing things are happening because we're not doing what we need to do to build ourselves up in the Word of God. We're not doing what it takes to find our strength that came from everything that Jesus went through on the cross, that he, that moment, at that moment in time, he had already begun to pay our sin debt. He had already, he paid, he paid past tense. It was paid. Our victory was won. The, uh, the, the sting of death was removed even from uh, the devil's hand. Satan has no power. But Jesus is all powerful. And the word of God teaches us that not only does he have power, that, but that when he returned, when he had come back to show himself to, to, to the disciples, he said, not only do I have power, but I have come that you might have even more power. So when we find ourselves stuck and stupid, we have to ask ourselves, why am I stuck in this place? What is happening in my life that for whatever reasons, I see the word, I read the word, I know the word, but I keep making excuses, no more excuses, y'all, as to why I'm here. Do you think it's simply okay? to be in that place? No, it's not okay. The Word of God teaches us that when we know better, we there's an expectation that we should do better. When we go to church Sunday after Sunday or whenever the time frame may be, may be and we're studying the Word of God, there should be something so in us that's moving us to want to do everything that Christ has called us to to do. There should be something that motivate us so to the place that, and it's not works that's going to get you into the kingdom, but your love for a God that loved us so much till we celebrate this time frame where Jesus went to the cross on our behalf, that we do it out of love. Out of love. We should do that thing. Amen? And so we have to ask ourselves, what's preventing us? What's preventing us? from doing some of the things that we should do versus uh, worrying about what people may say, think, or feel about us. Number two, if the answer is yes, then we have to take up our cross daily. Now, in Luke, it, it says in this 23rd verse, it says, this is chapter 9, chapter 9, verse 23 and 24, it says, then he said to them all, he said to them all, not this person or that person that skipped over this person. He said to them all, oh, this is Jesus talking. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Let's talk about this piece daily. Okay? Because we're talking about the place of being sanctified. We're talking about dealing with our crosses. What's your cross? Your cross is anything that would hinder you, anything that would hinder me from being where I need to be at all times when it comes to Christ Jesus. Amen. Anything that would cause me to offend the word of God, it is not of God. Anything that would cause you to do something to offend who God is, that is not of God. And so you won't be strengthened if you don't read God's word to know God's word, to be able to apply God's word. That's being, uh, that's operating in wisdom so that we won't fall as often as we do. Because sometimes we fall just out of pure ignorance. We just 
don't want to do better when we know better. That's what ignorance is. You know that the word of God has declared that vengeance is his, but instead you still go try to take something into your hands because you're going to, uh, I forget what they call people, vigilantes. They go out and they, they do things because they call themselves working on a behalf of some wrong that's been done to somebody. But the word of God says that vengeance is his, saith the Lord. But you go take it upon yourself to handle that thing. And what happens to you? If you caught, you go to jail. If you're not caught, and in some cases they send you to the, depending on what you did, they send you, uh, what is it, to the death chamber. They kill you. But in other cases, if you never got punished for it from the judicial system, then you're going to have that thing on your heart for ages. You can't sleep well at night. You might be functioning. You might be living, but you ain't living the abundant life because you did something you had no right to do. And so we have to learn to not only read God's word, not only know God's word, but to apply God's word. Allow God to be the one who's going to take care of you, protect you, help you along the way so that you and I find ourselves on the right side of what God is doing. Who are you going to follow? Who are we going to follow? Are we going to follow the crowd? Are we going to scourge and mock and do these things because it seemed to have been the popular thing to do at that time frame? Or are we going to honor the Savior with the waving of the palms? Are we going to celebrate the life that we saw taking place while he walked among the, the living on the face of the earth? When we witness the many uh, miracles that he would wrought during that time frame. Where are we going to stand? And how many excuses today will we make up for not doing the right thing when we know better? Amen? So, number one, are you willing to follow Christ? Number two, if yes, then when? Then we have to take up our cross, and I'll take up that cross daily. That is simply, again, doing what you know to do to build a relationship with God that's going to help you in your daily walk, giving up things that might be a little difficult. Number three, no more excuses. Example, being mad with people and churches rather than focusing on that, uh, that which is in God uh, and and. Focus on the cross. Again, I said it earlier that we too often, we get caught up with people and instead of pro focusing on the perfect God, we look at the imperfect man and we put so much stock into that man, that woman, man, that we fail to see the God that's operating in them. And then we make decisions to leave a place or not be in a place or do a thing that we need to do. Why? Because we're looking for somebody to always dot every I and cross every T. Well, that's just not going to happen. You know, we are to live towards being perfected in our relationship and maturity and understanding the word, the word of God, but it's simply not, not going to happen because if it could, then we wouldn't be celebrating Palm Sunday leading up to the crucifixion and to glory be to God, Resurrection Sunday. Because if we could have, then they, we, we could have just stayed under the law of Moses, but we couldn't stay there. I've shared before with you, if, if it means getting my son to a hospital and the light is red, I'm going through the light as long as it's safe and nobody's going to hit me or I'm going to hit somebody. I will take the ticket if it means my life, my son's life being saved. I broke a law. That would be breaking a law. And so, again, we cannot keep the law at all times just because when you get people like the, the, the guy that's in there now, uh, you know, they're, they're things that are being made up that, my goodness, who knows? He would have us all. And with the spirit that he's operating in, have us hating on one another. That's what the goal of the enemy is to do. Have us going to war with one another. 
That's not what God has, has called us to do. The word of God says that I come that you not, not just have life, but you have this life and live it more abundantly. That we are one another's keeper, not keeping people from coming over to have a better way of living. That ain't God. That ain't God. So we have to know the word of God. We have to follow the word of God. We have to trust and believe the word of God to be who he say he is. And that anything that's not happening for us, we got to give it back over to him. Things may not always happen on our time frame, but we got to believe that it will happen. We got to be believe that at his timing is going to be perfect. It's going to be right. Amen. And so we have to recognize again, what is the cross representing? What is this triumphal walk into Jerusalem uh, meaning? What does it mean to you and I? What does it mean as we move to uh, go to Good Friday and, and celebrate the, the Holy Week and all of those different things? It means that God doesn't just do anything. It means that we are to make a decision to follow Christ. And if we're going to do that, then we're going to take up our very own cross daily, whatever that might be. It might be eating Twinkies too many times. I like those, um, I'm guilty. I like those little cupcake orange hostess things. Oh, my goodness. I really like those. I don't know what it is. And I never really ate pastries. But I like those things. And so those and potato chips have been in a war. <laughs> And I've been in a war with them because I know I'm not supposed to eat them or I shouldn't eat them because they just aren't good for me. But I do it. Okay. So that's a, that's a cross for me. I have to deal with that because if I don't, eventually I'm going to end up with issues that are going to kill me. So what do I prefer to do? Do I prefer to do what I know to be right? Because even God's word, if, if, if we're talking about sin, to eat when you know you ain't hungry, you're sinning. That's called gluttony. Amen. And we must know those things so we can operate to do what God has called us to do and not offend him. If it offends the word of God, it should offend you and I. Amen. And then number three, again, just talking about, well, what is it that we're going to do? We need to learn to forgive people. We can't be holding people hostage over things that we can't control. Let it go already. Give people the opportunity to move forward in life. If Jesus could go to that cross on our behalf, and as they, he's being beaten, he's then been uh, pierced in the side with a sword, he's hanging up there, my Lord, with, with nails, with stakes driven through his hands and through his, his feet, thorns put on his head. And he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. If he being our high priest, if he being Jesus the Christ, if he being the triune God and can say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And he said that because we had not been able to experience in that time frame the unctioning of the Holy Spirit, which was to come to guide us. But there was some, there were some that were working off of the God in them that knew right from wrong. So now we are without excuse because the Spirit of the Lord works within us. There's no getting away from it unless we decide we're just not going to do it. Then you will cause yourself to be made reprobate because you can't be reprobate if you're already not doing what God has called you to do. So a reprobate person is someone in Christ professing that they're going to do what God has called them to do. And God will turn you over to yourself. Then what? You're constantly wondering. Things always go wrong. No matter what I do, there's always something. Why is it always something? Because even on your worst day, I mean, I, I always use a clock as the example. No matter how wrong and broke it may be, twice a day is going to tell the right time. So if God can do that with an inanimate object, certainly for those who he has breathed the breath of life in, he can do it for us. Who are we going to follow? And at what point will there be no more excuses? 
Time is winding out, my friends. And we have to make a decision what we're going to do, how we're going to do it. And it needs to be soon and very soon. Because I, the day nor the hour is not promised to us anymore. The scripture tells us that we have to take up our cross. So either we're going to do it or we're not. Either we're going to at least try to do the right thing. At least God is able to see our heart towards him or we're not. Even more importantly, what we have to understand is that when we're dealing with life, we have to recognize that the same things that Jesus was dealing with, these people wanted him dead because they feared him. So we got to get over how we feel about people and what they do and how they treat us. Their fear is what they see in us that we don't even see, us, see in us ourselves. The world is afraid that if you ever came to know who you really are in Christ Jesus, that you would be something else. And because the enemy sees that and knows that, he constantly tries to take you out. That's a good thing because you know you got something worth having. But for those who are just going through things and you can't figure it out, God is knocking at your door. And he's saying, let me in. But he will not break an entering. We must let him in. And so today, again, who are we going to follow? Our walk with Christ should be so to the point that when we walk in a room, the entire atmosphere changes because of that which is on us and in us. The spirit of, of the Lord should be so upon us that people shake when we walk into a room for fear of the power of God that's resting upon us, saturating and changing the atmosphere. Not because I said it, but because the word of God says it. That is the power that he's given us, that we would be able to trample over serpents, that we would be able to speak to the mountain and the mountain be thy removed. Do you believe what's in you? We must believe and we must die daily to the things of the world that are trying to keep us from seeing and understanding what God has done in our lives and what he's called us to believe. The Lord cares for us. If he didn't, we wouldn't be celebrating this moment in time. God allowed his son to come. To be the ransom, the payment, the debt fulfillment, the atonement for everything wrong that not only would happen then, but what would happen today and tomorrow, it's done. Our part is to no longer have any excuses and acknowledge that we have something we must do. How are we going to handle our lives as Christians? For one thing, we can't continue to be afraid to be who God has called us to be. Your confidence should be in God. Your confidence should be in everything you know. If you're reading his word, he has said you can be. He has things he has said you can do. He said that he would cause your vets to overflow. He said, if seek me early while I may be found. No more excuses. Time out. We have to readjust, reassess, revive ourselves. It's time for a revival. Whereby we get to know and understand that we have to make a decision who we're going to follow. Who are we going to found, be found? You know, there, there's some people, and, and this used to be me, not in the sense of what I know about Christ. But I was such a people pleaser that to keep peace, I would always just conform to whatever was going on. What did that look like if I didn't defend what I knew to be right? If you, if you sit silently in a place or something that you know is wrong, silence gives consent. If you know that's not where you're supposed to be, why are you there? I heard a preacher earlier today. He said, I won't be invited back. And I thought to myself, 
He's probably right. But my problem with that statement is that if the Spirit of the Lord, as a preacher, has already told you that you won't be invited back, then that same God had to have put something in your spirit to tell you what you were going to minister may not have been what you should have been ministering. So we serve a decent and an order God. A decent and an order God. He says that there's a time and a season for all things. And right now the time and season is that you and I would come, if you don't already know God, get to know him. If you're already in God, continue to strengthen yourself by his word. Because we're going to have to declare some things that should have already been done. We're going to have to deal with some things that if we are not ready, if we haven't chosen ye this day whom we're going to serve, we're going to be in a, in a, in a bad place between a rock and a hard place. I don't know what your deliverance may be. I don't know what you're going through. But I do know the word of God is true. That one day he's coming back. And he's coming back for a church without a spot nor wrinkle. Where will you be found? Keeping in mind that the scripture also teaches us that there will be those that say that I laid hands on the sick and they got well. That I laid hands on the dead and they rose. That I prayed and I this and I that. And I'm paraphrasing. And the word of God will say, and I knew you not. Will that be you? You have to ask yourself the question. And the only way you will know that with confidence, if you're spending time in the word of God, where you're not afraid to defend God, not fight about his word, but to, to defend what you know to be truth. Today, make the decision, who are you gonna follow? Or are you gonna continue down the road of excuses because you're not ready yet to give up on the things that you believe of making your life something beautiful. On the worst day of a person's life, if they are, I'll use my mother, I don't know what she was thinking, but I do know the conversation she had with me as a little girl. She would always say, Sharon, don't worry about me. When it's time for me to go, God is gonna take me quickly. And I had no idea what she was really talking about because while I may have been saved, I wasn't surrendered and I wasn't doing things that it took to know the word of God at that time. I was little. But as I surrendered my life to the Lord and I began to study God's word and know God's word for myself, understand the mind of God and how he operates and what his promises say and how to get to his promises by way of his precepts and his principles, then I was able to gain and understand what she meant when she laid on her deathbed. And she said to me, I'm tired. Because my mother would never say the word, she's tired. I would run in the house and say, I'm tired. She'd say, what do you mean you're tired? I'm X amount of years old, whatever she may have been. But when she mumbled the word, she was tired. I knew she was right. And so... What she did was tell me to take care of my children, and particularly my son at that time, who was also battling stage four adult leukemia. She said, God has given me more than he ever promised. You take care of your babies. They made arrangements through hospice, she said, because she wanted, she didn't want anything to be done. She said, let me go with my dignity. Not long after that, she said her goodbyes to, my, to me and my brother. And she took her last breath on the day that she was supposed to go, we think, at home. She was thinking, home, heaven, paradise bowed. And she closed her eyes. And she went on to see Jesus. And she was able to do that in a confidence that, that she knew that when this world is all over, when this day is all done, that she was going to be in the bosom of the Father. 
And so, as I wrote my post for any of you that read it, on that fateful day, I could only imagine, once I got over the shock of what had happened, because she was just so uh, diva S, as my mama the pastor was, the preacher. She said, uh, she said, is Bubba here? That's my brother. She grabbed his hand. She said, son, don't nobody love you like I do. And then she said to me, Sharon, go slow. Go slow, Sharon. Sharon, go slow. And she looked up to the heavens. And she closed her eyes for the last time. The only way you get that confidence is if you are sure beyond a doubt that you know that Jesus is real. And I can tell you as her child, watching her, how she did things, when the scripture text says that we are to be content in everything that we do, she was content in everything she did. Nothing moved her. If the building was on fire, she was still here. If she was on the ocean, she was still here. Because her peace, her comfort, her confidence was in the Savior, the one who had already took away the sting of death. So all she would get at this point was her ticket to glory. And so likewise, we must know and be in that same place because it's going to happen. God did just like she said. He took her. She did not linger. But some of us may not have the opportunity to do what we're supposed to do to get right with God. And we don't want people having to think about that old song and nobody yield the opportunity. Get right, church, and let's go home. Oh, get right, church, and let's go home. Get right, church, and let's go home. I'm going home on the morning train. Evening train may be too late. Y'all know the song. There will be a time where it will be too late. This moment in time as we celebrate Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, no better time than the present to think about what was happening and why Jesus had to come. And now that he's come, he suffered the death of the cross. But on the third day he rose again. Why in the world would you or I allow that opportunity, a sin debt paid that we could not pay ourselves, a ransom paid that we could not pay ourselves, to go in vain? Now is the time. If you're not sure and you're doing things in life, and I'm not being a, I'm not a legalistic Christian, but the Bible does teach us that we're to be sanctified. That if we look like the world, then what's the difference between us and the world? And I'm not saying that that's why I wear long skirts. I just, I've always liked these quarter length dresses and long skirts. This is who I am. But the Bible even teaches to dress in modesty. He says nothing about parading yourself around as something cheap or that you're just giving away. And then you get mad because people say stuff. Read the word of God. Get to know the word of God so that you can operate according to God and stop acting in ways that put you in a, in a, in a position where people wonder about the God that you serve. Because if you are professing Christianity, then it ought to be something that shows that. Who are you following? No more excuses. So for any of you that have not been certain about what you want to do, today I invite you to give your life to the Lord. Before I do that, uh, I always like to leave you with a scripture text. Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. Again, Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. And it reads, And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, 
he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Now here God has already forgiven us for all of our trespasses, everything and anything that we would do. And yet we don't want to forgive somebody that we sit next to every day in church or that we see or that might be on the same team or group with somebody because we think we better than them. That, I'm going to tell you like it is. You obviously think you better and that God's grace and mercy is only for you. Let me finish reading the scripture. Number 14 says, having wiped out the handwriting of requirement. This means that he took away all the law, all of the things that say you have to do this. We got to go kill a bull. We got to put uh, blood across our door. We got to find a dove. We got We don't have to do that. All we have to do is believe the word of God continues requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, everything that we would have had to have done for our own sin debt to be paid in order to pay our own ransom, he did. And this is Bible. This is not me. This is Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. It says, and this is 14a, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, all of our sin debt. 15, having disarmed principalities <laughs> and powers, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them in it. He's taken away even what principalities, even what people would stand in judgment and try to do to you. He's taken it away. We have no excuse. We're without excuse. So when my family, at what point do we decide that today is today? That I say, yes, Lord, you stand at the door and knock and I let you in. Come, sanctify me, fill me with the Holy Ghost. Anoint me from head to toe. I repent of anything that I've done by thought, word, or deed against you. Renew my spirit and right, make unto me a right mind. Transform me, Father, in the name of Jesus, that I might become as you desire for me to be. I do believe that Jesus died on that cross. And on the third day he rose, and now he sits at the right hand of God the Father. This is an, op an opportunity to remember what was done just for us. It's been done. The debt's been paid. It's done. We don't have to worry about anything. When somebody tries to remind you of your past, you remind them of their future. Because they do have a future waiting for them. The word Romans 8 and 1 says that there's now therefore no condemnation for them who are in Christ Jesus. If you are in Christ Jesus, if you have accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, and you messed up, come on back. Come back home. That's all you got to do. Come back home. Your family is waiting for you. I'm your sister. Been there, done that. And I'm all the, all the better because of it. But don't let what the crowd says or what people say be the cause of you not seeking the perfect God in the imperfect man. You're not going to find a perfect church. You're not going to find that perfect. Somebody's going to always hurt your feeling. And any anybody that's loving you, seeing you going astray, if they don't trigger your thought process, then you got to wonder about if you're in the right relationships, if you're spending time with the right people, if you're lending space to the right people. Because everything that's good ain't God. So we have to make a decision, my friends. Remember. Our debt has been nailed to the cross. It's done. There ain't no more reenactments. It's done. In the name of Jesus. I pray this message has blessed you in some sort of way. I pray that it will encourage and inspire those that are already saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. Because it's going to take really working to be sanctified, to walk the road of righteousness in God. Not our own righteousness, but the righteousness to which Jesus gives us. Amen? Amen. To God be the glory.
I pray to God that um, he will be with you, continue to be with you, and that you, you, and you will find yourselves making peace with those people in those situations that have you bound and captive. It's one thing to be locked up in a jail and behind a place where, you know, somebody has you in captivity. You still have access to different things in some situations. So that's pretty decent. It's a really bad thing to be bound and locked up in your mind. It's just you and between these ears. And ain't much happening. So we must give it all to God. Amen. So again, blessings to you. Enjoy the rest of your Palm Sunday. And I pray that this message has inspired you, encouraged you in one way or the other. That if you didn't know Christ, you'll get to know Christ. If you weren't sure about the Lord, that you would then come back to Christ. And, and say these, these words to yourself. Who am I going to follow? Will I be like some of those that were in the crowd and that other uh, criminal that was uh, on the cross uh, on the side of Jesus? Or will we be like those that were waving the palms, singing Hosanna in the highest? Will we be like that other criminal, that thief that, that said this man has done no wrong? And Jesus was able to say to him on oh, this day, this day, not tomorrow, but this day you shall be with me in paradise. Don't let people get between you and your destination in Christ. Again, I mentioned to you earlier regarding the Serebrenetian woman when the disciples said, Jesus, send her away. She's bothering us. That woman wasn't after them. She was after the source. She knew who had her answer. So don't let that kind of people, and the same as the woman as she was putting the oil on the feet and the hair of God when she was praising him in a way that she was praising him. And they're talking about what they could have used that money to use to do with that money if they sold that oil. Don't let them kind of people steal away your blessing, your miracle. Because they, they show it. They, they, again, these were, these were Jesus' boys. These were the disciples. They knew better. So that shows us that there are even some folks that are perpetrating, being Christians and doing the right thing. Everybody going to mess up every now and then. That's why we got to know the word of God for ourselves. We got to know it for ourselves. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Uh, anytime, 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings, you can visit us in Fayetteville, North Carolina or Bowie, Maryland. And uh, we're grateful. You can go to our website, Run and Shout Ministries, the number one, dot org. Amen. There you can see what we're doing in the communities, what we're doing for the homeless, what we're doing for the schools, uh, what we're doing to help people both financially and every way we can to be better, not just uh, here spiritually, but recognizing that God has said that we can have heaven on earth. There's a way there. Amen. And so we pray that you would go to Run and Shout Ministries, the number one, dot org, and see what God is doing. And there you will find our address. You will find uh, our cash uh, app. And I think that's what they call cash app. The Givelify, PayPal, and uh, our addresses to uh, mail any donation that you would like to give to us as we continue to lift up and take care of those in our communities. Amen. God bless you. Till next time. Amen.